Have you ever wondered how we're going to communicate with machines in the future? Or how they might communicate with us? Join me as we discover a world of chips with everything. Welcome to Chips With Everything. Tonight, we're going to look at the extraordinary way in which computers have influenced almost every aspect of our lives. Now, I'd like to start by finding out how many computers you have at home. If you have no computers, I want you to press button A. If you have between 1 and 5, you can press button B. If you have between 6 and 10, you can press C. And if you have more than 10 computers at home, you can press button D. OK, I'd like you all to press your buttons now, please. OK, and we bring up the results. And it looks as if most of you have between one and five computers at home. Well, that's interesting. It may surprise you, then, to know that the average UK household today has over 100 computers. Computing is undergoing a transformation from a box on your desktop to a world in which computers are built into all sorts of everyday objects, from washing machines to thermostats and from televisions to toys. Every year, 100 million new microprocessors are made for desktop and laptop computers. But around 100 times as many as that are made for these embedded applications. And we're just at the beginning of this revolution. Now, perhaps the most important example of an embedded computer is the mobile phone. Now, of course, originally, the mobile phone was developed for audio communication. And we have here a clip from the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures back in 1985. <laughs> Find the phone under your seat there that's ringing. OK? Would you like to press the orange button, please? It'll take the call and then use it as an ordinary phone. Hold it up to your ear. Hello? Can you hear me on the phone? Very clearly. Good. Can you tell me your name, please? Natural Charles Lovell Core. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the sort of phone that was being used in that clip. And I'm actually delighted to say that Max has joined us this evening. So, Max, welcome back to the Christmas Lectures. Thank you very much. I expect you have a rather smaller phone these days, do you? Yep, somewhat. <laughs> okay, excellent. Very Thank exciting. you very much. Well, before the digital revolution, information technology came in lots of separate packages like this got a dictionary, and this uh, thing here, this is called a typewriter, in case you've not seen one of those before, and we've got a globe and a radio and so on. Well, today, the work of all these items and many more can all be done by a single device. And this is possible because the mobile phone is really a computer. Now, people aren't just carrying computers around in their pockets, they're also beginning to wear them. And here's Wendy, she's wearing lots of different computers. Here, if we just turn around a little bit. Here she has a Bluetooth earpiece, so she can chat to her friends while she's jogging. She has, uh, just turn around again, a heart rate monitor, uh, a GPS on her wristwatch. And uh, on her running shoes, she has a small computer that's measuring her running pace. Now, she's also wearing this. This is called a sense cam. It's a type of camera, and it has a wide-angle lens. And it takes a photograph every time it detects a change in light level or movement. Now, we can see the results of this. This is a little video made by Andy when he was wearing the sense cam. He and Lewis were busy building props for this lecture. So here they are cycling off to the electronics shop. And they're buying some components. And here they are cycling back to the Royal Institution to get on with those props. Well, the sense cam then is a fun way to record an event, such as a family day out. And it's also been found useful for people with certain kinds of memory loss, things like Alzheimer's. 
They can review their day's events, and it just helps them to remember what's happened. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Now, the sense can helps us with our memory, but could computers also improve our senses? Well, I'm going to show you something now which I think is actually very remarkable. This is a video of a little girl called Tara, and this is taken when she was just three years old. As you can see, she's learning to use sign language. Yes, good girl. Car. Uh, car. Uh, Good girl. Now, Tara is completely deaf. She can't understand speech. But also, she can't learn to speak because she can't hear the sound of her own voice. That's this one. Sit down. Sit down. That's a good girl. Birthday cake. That one. Birthday cake. Well, we can understand the reason for Tara's deafness by having a look at this model of the ear. Of course, this is the part on the outside that collects the sound. The sound passes inside, where it's sent through some little bones to this organ here. And this spiral-shaped organ is called the cochlea. Now, the cochlea takes the vibrations of the sound waves and turns them into electrical signals, which are then sent along this nerve fibre to the brain. Now, in Tara's case, the cochlea was damaged, but the nerve was still working correctly. And so a surgeon inserted a special device into Tara's cochlea. Now, this is the part of the device that goes on the outside. So... This part here is worn over the ear and it has a little microphone and this is a little transmitter. And then on the inside, there's a, a receiver and a little computer processor chip which then sends signals along a little fibre to some electrodes. And here we have a little X-ray video showing these electrodes being inserted. Here's the spiral shape of the cochlea. Each of these is one of the electrodes. And you can see the wires that lead from the electrodes back out to the computer processor. Now we can see how that works by looking at this demonstration. Inside this box are some electronics which are just the same as the electronics inside the implant. So you can see again the spiral shape of the cochlea and each of these green circles represents one of the electrodes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play a tone that will start off at a low pitch and it will gradually increase in pitch. And what we should see is that the low frequencies are sent to the small inner region of the cochlea and the high frequencies go to the large outer region. So let's just play that tone and see if we can see that. Okay. Well, it was 10 years ago that Tara received her implant and to see what effect this has had, could you please give a very special Royal Institution welcome to Tara. <laughs> Tara, welcome to the Christmas lectures. What's the implant meant to you then? Well, this um, implant has helped me hear and respond to conversations and help me hear and it's really helped us so far. Fantastic. I mean, you seem to be able to speak wonderfully. It's amazing. Yeah. And are there situations where it's harder to, to hear what people are saying? Um, yeah, with the background, and it makes me work harder, but it's right. great to have a cochlear implant. Brilliant. Um, do you listen to music at all? I do as well, and my favourite band is JLS. Oh, right, OK. Well, the surgeon who performed this extraordinary operation, his name's Roger Gray, and uh, Roger is sat up there in the balcony. Hello, Roger. Welcome. <laughs> Well, Tara, Tara, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think that really is an extraordinary example of the power of digital technology. Now, after the break, we're going to be looking at the way we can build computers into all kinds of everyday objects, and we'll be giving them some exciting new capabilities. So join me then.